things up uh, on our end. Um, we'll, uh, we, we hope to present uh, some information and uh, hope at the end to have a, a robust uh, Q&A session and uh, hope it's uh, very informative for everybody that's on the call today. Uh, Paul, John? Thank you. Um, my name is Paul Heckethorn. I am the practice director, as he mentioned, for all covered slash Konica Minolta. I've been in K-12 for about 20 years now and working with schools. Spent time as a public school board member as well. So I understand uh, a lot of the challenges that are faced by schools, not only from a technology standpoint, but just an, uh, an overall operational standpoint in dealing with budgets and, and trying to uh, stay current with 21st century or future readiness technology. Um, you know, our group combined, there, there's many folks in our team that have over 20 plus years in ed tech. Our teaching learning consultants are, have come from uh, public school districts or, or private schools and worked as a director of technology uh, or tech coordinators. And so they, cl they clearly understand uh, what you're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have John Clements, who's our dedicated solutions architect for education. Uh, he's been working in K-12 for over five years and has a good grasp on why schools need a robust infrastructure and the challenges around security and he'll get into that a little bit later. And then we have a, a wide range of engineers, over 800 across the country, that have all different types of certifications. And so not only from a local market standpoint, but from a national standpoint, we have uh, depth and economies of skill and scale. And then we do per participate in cooperative purchasing contracts for K-12, uh, as well as higher ed. And so uh, we'll get into the overall presentation. The first part of the presentation I, I want to mention is that we're just going to give some background and high-level overview of what schools are thinking about, what some of their challenges are, and then we'll get into an example of a school in Michigan and how they went about trying to resolve some of those challenges and, and try to, try, trying to um, get competitive uh, in, in this 21st century. Um, so we know that technology alone does not transform learning, rather technology en enables transformative learning. We know that technology is a tool and that technology alone will not improve test scores. It still is teacher-centered and student-centered. So for us to really recommend or think about technology, you know, we really have to start with what is the school's mission and vision, and how is that going to impact the day-to-day -day learning? And how is it going to transform the learning process for today's student? Um, you know, there's about 30 states right now that are future ready or have taken the future ready pledge. Um, and with that, you know, there's certain characteristics with a future ready or 21st century school. This goes back quite some time. Uh, I'm located in the state of Pennsylvania, and we started out with ed tech plans uh, back in the early 2000s. And it was state mandated. And to get certain funding, uh, it was incorporated with the strategic plan for a school district. So part of that, you know, and, and part of my knowledge and, and um, background is based off of doing ed tech planning for schools. And a, a key component of that is the buy-in or the backing of the administration and the leadership and the culture within a school and creating a shared vision for all stakeholders. Uh, John was just at a school in Colorado and they really focus on making sure that they get teacher buy-in, uh, that they're able to uh, collaborate and set shared goals and have, have that shared vision from the superintendent all the way down. Uh, another area that really uh, is common recently is the word ROI, and, and it's not the return on investment. Although, you know, putting money into technology, um, we're talking more about return on instruction. So, you know, what are we investing our budget dollars in today? 
Are you, are you creating a budget that aligns with the school's mission and vision for curriculum? Are you uh, creating that or setting aside money for foundational technology that will support the instructional technology? And then, you know, how many schools out there are taking advantage of, of the E-rate program? We're in the fifth year of E-rate uh, in the current program. And so, you know, there's a lot of money out there that's not even being utilized. And so making sure that uh, you're taking advantage of the E-rate to help support your, your infrastructure is, is a key component. And then we're seeing a lot of schools that are redesigning learning spaces making it flexible, collaborative. You know, we're, we're focused on the on-demand generation of students or the Netflix generation of students that are used to gaining access to information real time. I have a 14-year-old son that he watches a ton of YouTube videos and he's able to go out and search a topic and pull down information that uh, um, as I, if I look back to and myself, you know, I had to go to the library and open up a book or it took time to actually research and find information where they're, they're able to gain information real time. And uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a great way for our students to learn today. And we're finding a lot more schools are doing that flip type classroom approach and having schools doing research or students do their research on their own and coming back and discussing in the classroom. Um, you know, one of the key areas that we find that schools who invest in technology but maybe are not, are kind of muddling along or struggling, is that they invest all this money in technology but they don't allocate funds for professional development. And professional development for teachers and staff is, is a, a key component for making sure that your investment dollars are spent wisely and that the teacher is able to take that technology and utilize it effectively in the learning process. And then lastly, the, you know, the, the community engagement and partnerships, reaching out to uh, maybe key stakeholders in the community that have a technology background, helping them or asking them to uh, be part of your tech council as a community member, or even having access, uh, providing classes or information around technology, inviting the community into to your school. We, we know for a fact that time is ticking to prepare students for jobs. There's a Heckinger report that just went out that said that we as a country are not keeping up or progressing fast enough to provide the skill sets for students today uh, that will translate into that 21st century knowledge worker. So we're really, we're really trying to focus and help schools understand that technology um, is impactful in the learning process and that they need to make sure that they have a, a three-year plan that's current and, and being monitored. Um, so, you know, future readiness aligned with the Office of, of Technology. As I mentioned earlier, there's 30 states out there that are have taken the pledge of future readiness. Uh, there's seven gears or areas of focus in the future ready that we are closely aligned with, um, curriculum instruction and assessment, the use of time and space, uh, robust infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you don't have access or if students are coming in with a BYOD device or you're looking to move to one-to-one -one or even, even higher than that, two-to-one, uh, you have to have a robust infrastructure. You know, we're take, students are taking in some cases, even having three devices. So they have their phone, they have their laptop, and maybe they are accessing a school computer. So a lot more devices are hitting the network and making sure that that access anywhere, anytime in a school is, is critical. And then, you know, as I mentioned, per personalized professional learning and budget and resources. Some of the trends that we're seeing, this was uh, published in Forbes magazine. But you can go out to EdTech Magazine, eSchool News, uh, any of those publications, and they're going to have their own set of trends. But most of them um, are all focused on the same basic trends. There may be one or two that are different. But 
augmented reality and virtual reality is really starting to take a, a uh, foothold in, in schools. Again, infrastructure is important to being able to utilize that type of technology. We're seeing, you know, gamification. Kids, uh, you know, are utilizing Xbox or any type of gaming device at home. They're used to that, and so they like the competition. They like to be able to have that as interactive, and you know that that type of learning excites uh, students of today. So we're seeing a lot more gamification in in, in the classroom. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of different devices. Obviously, Chromebooks are are taking the lead as of as of late, but we're still seeing Apple. We're still, still seeing Microsoft devices, any type of tablet um, or Android device. So it, there's a combination, and and schools have to be prepared for that mix of devices. Uh, personalized learning. Uh, you know, each student learns a little bit differently today, and, and schools are starting to adapt to that personalized learning. And the, the day when IEPs become uh, widespread for every student is almost upon us, or is upon us. Uh, and then artificial intelligence, robotics. We're starting to see a lot more schools invest in robotics or robotics labs, or part of the Educate Robotics Foundation in going to competitions. Uh, so it's an exciting time for education around uh, those type of technologies and as I mentioned earlier redesigned learning spaces you know the Starbucks type environment or um, any type of coffee shop where it's wide it's open people are getting together at tables and and discussing um, project-based learning or discussing projects that have been allocated uh, from their teachers so you know schools that are preparing to transform they really have to understand where they're at today um, and maybe what some of their strengths are, but also what some of their weaknesses are, and where do they where do they think they are today? Um, this this slide is is loosely based off of a Gartner slide on digital transformation. Um, you know, there's four stages or five stages. We we consolidated the four stages where you know there's schools out there that are still chaotic. Um, Technologies may be old or negatively affecting uh, the, the student learning process. Maybe the network is old or, or it's not robust enough that, that the, there's too many devices and they're not getting access real time or not prepared for personalized or uh, online testing. And the network's not documented, it's unpredictable, and the, the technology itself is not standardized and aligned with curriculum. And then there's some schools that are, are reactive. You know, they may have started down the ed tech planning process, um, but not SD compliant, occasional PD days on uh, students or teacher and service days. Um, they've invested in technology, but they're still in that traditional classroom drill and kill uh, type environment where still row based uh, students, still teacher in front of the classroom, not really collaborative. And you know the tech department's constantly fighting fires, and then you start getting to more of the proactive area where you know integrated technology is incorporated with the, the curriculum. Three um, D and robotics labs, maker spaces are are implemented. You know, really starting to test those new learning spaces, and then you get all the way to the future readiness, where STEM and STEAM programs are uh, implemented. They are thriving. Uh, PD academies are established within the school where you and you have teach the teacher, and then you you know you know you're really looking at distance learning areas within the school, and IT and curriculum are aligned, and so that's you know a little bit of background. You know, really, it's up to the school to determine where they're at and where they want to go, and you know, companies will help. If, if needed, if you don't have the robust or internal resources to um, to, go, to go in that direction, you know, there's outside resources to be able to help you do that. Um, we, we would like to take a, a few minutes to just to talk about the school district in Michigan. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, they were, I would say, at the chaotic stage or somewhere in between the chaotic and um, the next stage and they decided that they wanted to 
look at the entire infrastructure and look at the what they're doing from a learning perspective and do an ed education technology assessment and it, the EdTech assessment is really around a holistic evaluation analysis of your infrastructure the EdTech what's your budget look like are you is enough money being allocated by the school boards to um, fund new initiatives you know what's the current technology and support process look like is there a help desk in place are you tracking uh, issues are you able to uh, make data driven decisions based off the data of not only education but also help tickets around IT and then they were able to take that comprehensive report in a three-year roadmap and start to do start to work towards an implementation process uh, the education part of it you know there's a survey that the teachers and, and staff but it's really based around SD standards and really focusing on those key areas um, equitable equitable access we know that you know urban schools have an issue with that but as well as rural so we we also know that over 50% of the schools out there in the US over 7,000 are, are considered rural and so sometimes connectivity or access is a challenge and so working towards equitable equitable access sorry um, is a challenge and one that we are looking to help schools um, you know remedy if you look at really understanding what the teachers perception of technology you may be amazed at what they believe they where they believe they are with technology versus maybe where the school board thinks technology is at or where the administration um, believes technology is at today um, yeah you know example of a teacher survey based off of the essential conditions you know this school district as an example they had three areas that were approaching not one single area that they were they thought that they were meeting based off the survey and then a lot were at the beginning stages I'm going to turn over to John Clemens um, for a few slides around the foundational technology in the assessment and he can, uh, Thank he can you, definitely Paul. provide yep yeah. So, so one other, so beyond the use of technology in the classroom, one area essential to any of that technology working is the infrastructure in which it runs on the, the network environment, um, the wireless environment, and all the connectivity for all those devices. Um, so in any type of assessment, you know, understanding the foundational technology, getting a clear map of what the network looks like all the way down to its physical topology as well as its logical topology. Understanding the hardware in a network, uh, we see a lot of times that hardware is added on top of old hardware uh, instead of removed, uh, as well as uh, things that are just sort of misconfigured or not optimally configured uh, to provide the best performance of a network. So looking at both how the network's laid out as well as the performance you know which areas of the network are being utilized the most where which classrooms might be utilizing technology and ban and more bandwidth on the network and really understanding you know where investments in technology need to happen um, as paul mentioned equitable access to technology is is a common goal of schools but what we've learned is consumption is not always equitable uh, certain subjects utilize technology utilize technological resources in higher demand than others. Uh, we've seen language arts and social studies classes utilize more online video content than maybe a math class, and those classes tend to tax a network harder. Uh, but a lot of networks are built uniformly, where every classroom, every section of the building has equal bandwidth, uh, equal capacity to handle devices, but the consumption is not equal. So understanding all of that is an important uh, aspect of any type of technology assessment and for future planning. So Paul, next slide. Yeah. As I talked about understanding where data flows, uh, where there may be a potential bottleneck within a network, um, 
you know, are you having communication issues from a certain classroom to the internet? You know, where, where, where does that data travel throughout the network and identifying if there are any problem devices on that route? Next slide. And again, this goes back to talking about, you know, performance, how much, how much bandwidth is being consumed from a particular location within the network or a particular access point and to look at, you know, the need, a potential need for additional capacity in certain places so that the quality of service and quality of network uh, performance is equal to all students as well as being able to have the equitable access. Next slide. You know, uh, as I said, understanding all the networking devices is important. Uh, knowing what you have in your environment, what hardware may be coming end of life, what hardware may already be end of life, and being able to prioritize what needs to be replaced and when, as well as identifying you know, the utilization of those devices. We've seen as a large shift has happened uh, to towards wireless devices away from fixed computer labs and hardwired devices, that the number of switch ports being utilized in schools is greatly decreasing. But during a refresh cycle, uh, if switches are being replaced port for port, instead of evaluating if a reduction in switch capacity may be, may be uh, a proper decision based on the fact that maybe you replace physical computer labs with working spaces that are just wirelessly connected where you may used to had 48 computers plugged into a 48 port switch where you now have an open collaborative workspace that has one access point in the ceiling and you're utilizing less network ports. Um, it makes it help, again helps in the decision making process on future upgrades and spending on network infrastructure. Next slide. So out of all that in any type of assessment report, you really want the analytical data of the teacher surveys, um, you know, an infrastructure analysis of issues, um, the critical, the criticality of that issue, as well as any um, best practice recommendation. But then most importantly, a budget analysis, understanding what it will cost to remediate any of these issues as well as for planning for long term. Not every issue that's found during an education uh, assessment is a critical issue or an immediate issue, but should be known about and planned for so that it can be budgeted down the road. Next slide. Pass this back to you, Paul. Thank you, John. Uh, one of the things that we see in, in schools that are successful is a technology district technology committee and that has all the key stakeholders involved it has the administration it has curriculum it has the technology department and that has a represent representation of teachers and principals and then as i mentioned earlier some in some cases schools will ask ask a community member to participate or or two um, i did serve on my school's uh, technology committee as a community member, uh, just from my background. But you know that's not going to happen in every every school district. But the monthly meetings around with a technology committee, um, you're able to govern the progress around your ed tech plan and able to communicate issues, review IT, um, any type of IT issues, but also focus around future initiatives and where are you at? Uh, are you following the EdTech plan? Are you, you know, at, e at the end of each year, are you regrouping and saying, okay, maybe that part of the plan is outdated or we've shifted focus based off of need. Uh, and so that you're adjusting uh, on the fly, but there's a governance in place to, to make sure that, you know, you're moving forward and holding each other accountable. Um, you know, with, with the tech committee, the tech council monitors that three-year roadmap with information from an assessment. The tech committee helps set priorities based off the mission and vision of the plan and the budget. 
And the, the document helps, you know, creates a document that all stakeholders can view. And so we see the, those type of documents on the school district's website for the community to see. Uh, the teachers can see it. Everybody is, you know, rowing in the same direction. Um, not to say that there aren't challenges along the way, but um, at least there's a there's a plan or in a roadmap uh, with with uh, the governance in place, and then make sure the new technology purchase is aligned with curriculum goals. You know, it's not it's just not reactive. I've seen a lot of times over the years where, uh, you know, whether it's a district tech coordinator or curriculum specialist, somebody goes to a trade show and comes back all excited about a new technology. And, you know, where does that fit in the overall plan? It may be the greatest technology, but if it's not properly aligned with, you know, the mission and vision and the, and the plan, it may not be a good uh, opportunity to purchase uh, that particular technology. So, you know, we try to help or recommend schools that uh, that follow uh, that type of governance. And I review the plan yearly, as I said, just based on uh, need. How schools are funding, you know, part of the, uh, the foundational part of the technology is through E-rate. There was a ton of money left over uh, the past couple of years of schools that have either waited or have not taken advantage of E-rate. And, you know, depending on whether you're 20% of E-rate based off the free and reduced lunch or you're at 85 or 90 percent you know it's still helping to fund um, the technology and the core infrastructure and the wireless um, you know category one at the end of this year will, will be completely gone away from funding I don't know what the new um, e-rate plan will 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 be uh, con will consist of in 2000 after 2019 but we do know that category two right now is, is the focus. And you know, when it was originally put into place was to get a device in every student's hands. And we've seen a lot of progress in schools uh, upgrading their core infrastructure and uh, deploying access points that meet the needs of uh, their students. Um, after the assessment, you know, schools start to focus on the digital learning component or the flexible learning spaces traditional classroom setting and it could be a, a number of different things whether it's 3d printing interactive technology as, as I mentioned earlier the, you know could be an Android device could be Microsoft could be a Chromebook uh, many different ways to uh, deliver lessons and deliver curriculum a, a key example of what we're seeing out there is, you know, in the makerspace area of 3D printing, you know, there's a, a software called My STEM Kits. Uh, it is a curriculum for specific for K through 12. It's got over 100 different lesson plans. But schools are using that curriculum now, and there is a curriculum around 3D printing. A few years ago, schools were buying 3D printing devices without any reason why other than they went to a trade show and it was it was the coolest thing to watch um, a car being printed out or some other type of um, device. Uh, so really uh, having a nice plan or a good plan around curriculum in the makerspace area, uh, purchasing the curriculum is, is key. And I believe my STEM kits will work with not only the, the Dremel printer, but it will work with all kinds of different 3D printers. Uh, 64 lesson plans, 107 middle school, 93 high school lessons as an example. A lot of professional development uh, needed around that, or I should say not a lot of professional development needed around that. Typically uh, a day to, to get up to speed. And we're seeing widespread implementation of these type of devices um, in K-12. As I mentioned earlier, professional development is a key component. Um, I'm going to turn this over to, to John, but you know we do know that what's top of mind for school superintendents and school boards, you know, in last year in California, school security was the number one concern. 
obviously after the tragedy in Florida, it's went to top of mind across the entire U.S. So, John? Yeah, so, you know, physical security and cybersecurity are, are, you know, I think we'll talk about physical security first, are two main things that, as Paul said, schools are putting top of mind. Um, you know, and this is integrated with technology. It used to be security was separate from IT, but really with everything becoming computerized and electronic and connected to the network, IT has become an essential role of physical security of students uh, within the school. Uh, camera systems that can identify people who should or shouldn't be in the school. Visitor management systems, uh, replacing paper logbooks that can immediately check a driver's license against uh, criminal databases and sex offender registries is really important in schools. Uh, two of the main big products out there, School Aid Guardian and Raptorware, are, you know, are some that people uh, probably heard of, you know, to really understand who it is who's coming into those schools and not just a, a name written on paper, um, as well as, as identifying do the people who come into those schools uh, on a regular basis um, have proper vetting as well, uh, that they can come and go without uh, the same level of a vetting that a uh, one-time visitor may come in with. Next slide. Um, just a, a, a short a short piece on uh, Mobotics as one of those systems for visitor management, or not visitor management, but video surveillance. You know, identifying, you know, who comes into a school um, and being able to immediately alert someone uh, via automated text, audio alerts, phone calls, um, it's a great feature of this product. Uh, Mobotics actually utilizes a decentralized solution where all the cameras are their own video surveillance system. It, uh, record, it records the video, analyzes the video, and stores the video within each camera, uh, allowing these cameras to be deployed all across the school's network without putting additional load on the network. Uh, video can be offloaded to central storage on a schedule after hours, um, not to interfere with the network and take away from student learning, as a lot of video IP video camera systems do. Uh, another major benefit of the product is, is the licensing is all inclusive. Um, when you buy the camera, you get the software updates, you get the video management system, um, and you get all the features of the product, um, all included at a one-time cost with no ongoing uh, management fees, or not management fees, licensing fees and maintenance fees for the product. Next slide. As we talked about, um, it, you know, it has decentralized, as we talked about, it has the ability to control other devices. Uh, you can control door sensors with this. Uh, the door controls can be an extension of the video surveillance system. Uh, we've seen a lot of schools that the access control buzzer um, at most locations we go to is an isolated standalone system that connects the camera at the door to a small video screen in the office. Um, this can actually be a complete extent, it can be another surveillance camera within the larger network and not just the standalone system. So you can get that clear image of every person who approaches the door and be stored in the larger surveillance system. Um, it can identify behavior. Um, is someone running down a hall? Um, are people in areas they shouldn't be? All of these things can be analyzed within the camera and alerted to certain people based on time of day um, and, and other actions. It can also measure temperature and um, and environmental. So, you know, if you know if there are fire in the school, it can measure heat, um, potentially at even a lower temperature than before a fire alarm or smoke detector could go off, because um, you can look at very small incremental rises in temperature that may be abnormal, but within the limits of of what a smoke detector may not set off. So. And that's it. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to wrap things up, you know, schools 
or the different various various stages of transforming. Um, being prepared for future ready learning in the digital ecosystem that you see this graphic on on the slide. You know, each graphic is going to look a little bit different, or the ecosystem is going to be a little bit different in each school. Uh, but the, the key part of that is aligning with the school's mission and vision and the leadership and being able to support and align with the curriculum. It's the key to, you know, to growth and it's the key to uh, providing students what they need in terms of today's learning. They all have access or a great majority have access at home and are using technology uh, you know, they're digital natives. They're using technology in everything that they do. Um, and so we have to catch up. Um, before he jumps into this slide, I just want to make one quick last statement that we will be at ISTE in Chicago this year. If you have any questions or want to talk about any uh, particular subject around uh, digital transformation. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh Thanks, Paul. Thanks, John, for, for that information. Uh, to wrap things up, I, I wanted to highlight briefly the relationship that Konica Minolta has with uh, the ESU. Uh, we, we jointly support the AEPA contract, the, the nationally big contract. And the reason for that is to facilitate the procurement uh, of, of products and services uh, you know, for for schools. Instead, if the, if a school district wants to procure a product or a, or a service, instead of having to go through the cumbersome RFP process every time uh, you want to buy something, you're able to leverage the already competitively bid AEPA contract um, instead of going through that RFP process, and and thus. Is saving the, the school and school district the time and resources that would have been invested in an RP process back into back into uh, education and, and the students. So uh, we have a joint mission there uh, to help facilitate the, the that procurement process and all of the the products and services that you see on on this slide, including um, all of the IT uh, covered. Uh, oh, sorry, all covered IT services that that we've talked about today can be leveraged off of the, the AEPA contract um, uh, through the ESU. Uh, the next slide there uh, is just um, uh, the, the local Nebraska resources for you to tap into through Konica Minolta. If, if anyone on this call is interested in learning more about uh, anything, any of the topics discussed today, please reach out to the Nebraska Konica Minolta Education uh, Specialist. And uh, with that, uh, Craig will uh, go ahead and end the presentation portion and, and ask if there, there are any questions that, that we can help address at this time. Sure. Any questions from the group uh, from any schools, I guess? Not hearing any. Well, I appreciate uh, Konica and uh, All Covered uh, actually connecting with us today. Now, I do apologize that we didn't have more people connected today. Uh, it looked like we had quite a few respond, say they were going to be here, but uh, probably did not show up. But uh, uh, we will take and uh, take this recording, Aaron, and uh, post it, and I'll send that link over to you. And uh, I guess, uh, again, thank you for uh, the time and you know, to highlight your services. I know I learned a little bit. Uh, I, I guess uh, one question I have for Paul, uh, of the 20 states that are future ready, Nebraska is not included in those, are they? That's correct. Now, I, knew, I do know that uh, Nebraska uh, has a future ready committee put together and they actually met today. And uh, so ESUCC uh, is involved with that along with NDE. And so uh, Nebraska, uh, there, is, there is a movement at least to become future ready. Uh, and I'm not sure where that's going, um, but uh, there is a committee in the state uh, looking at that, so. Yeah, I actually met the author of Learning Transformed um, recently. 
And, you know, the future readiness is tied to the Office of, or the Department of Ed and Office of Educational Technology. And so, the, you know, it's a, there is a movement. There's 3,000 superintendents that have taken the pledge. And so there's a lot of great information on those sites. So, you know, we're closely aligned with that and believe we believe a lot of what they had to say. And um, I think it could only benefit the state to, to go in that direction. Well, and I will, I'll let our executive director know, you know, Konica Minolta's uh, uh, stance on, on future ready and, and resources, I guess, also, um, you know, because it, we may be a, a, a player in that field uh, moving forward then. And schools, I think you're going to start hearing that term more and more, uh, future ready. So uh, We're also a member of COSIN as well, so just to... Okay. I'm familiar Keep with that, that organization, too. Uh, any uh, final questions, I guess? Not hearing any. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys uh, connecting with us. Uh, if you guys want to go ahead and drop off uh, with Konica, and uh, we'll continue our meeting and see if we 